Recording. Welcome to the In Web Browsers and IPFS GUI team weekly sync call. Uh, we have an agenda, we have a bunch of lovely people. So we're going to start with a round of what I've done last week, what I would like to highlight to my fellow teammates. Um, Lydell, you are at the top of the bell. So may I open the floor to you? Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's go to the dock. Uh, Right, so updates are in the doc, so I'll only highlight interesting stuff. Uh, uh, I released a new version of isIPFS. Uh, it's a library for detecting IPFS resources uh, on the uh, on websites, and it now supports multi other and also uh, additional validation of uh, IPFS peer uh, multi others is there as well. And another release is new beta uh, of IPFS Companion, finally with per site redirect opt-out and small visual refresh of browser action uh, menu, which we already started uh, improving even further. So uh, if you are interested uh, in uh, per site redirect opt-out, it's here. And if you are interested in what's next for IPFS Companion UI, we have this issue linked there as well, which we continue to iterate some ideas. And there is a pull request, or maybe I'll just make a demo, quick demo of this. So, this is uh, IPFS website. Uh, it's our docs portal. And here you can see we have a parasite redirect opt out doing its magic. <laughs> so this is a first step in re revamping the uh, browser action menu. If anyone has any uh, opinions, how we can make it clearer. Uh, how we can explain things like pinning, or how can we make more obvious how what are we actually copying? Uh, all those things uh, are discussed in this uh, issue, and uh, I also created a bird's view of our uh, migration to CID version one. It's like work in progress. Uh, in the first comment in this meta meta issue, there's a table we, in which my goal is to track all, all the PRs that are already shipped or work in progress or things that we need to address. And there are also like levels of uh, like complexity. First is like ability to add and get data uh, using CIDs. In base 32, then we want to be able to retrieve. So those are basically done in both uh, uh, Go and uh, JS. And there's like separate topic of being ready to make a global switch. So here we see a lot of issues that Alan already started on the JS side. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, uh, changes related to Blockstore and DHT on the Go side. Uh, it will get better over time. It's the first pass I did, uh, just to give us a better understanding where we are and what remains to be done without go digging into issues. Uh, yeah, Oli. Can you show us the logo again? <laughs> sure. So the logo of entire endeavor is here. <laughs> and, uh, it's still and great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> and I, I'm blocked on interesting issue with uh, discrepancy in web extension APIs between Firefox and Chrome. Basically, uh, web request APIs that we use for uh, redirecting IPFS resources from, for, from uh, public gateway to local gateway. Uh, Firefox supports promises there. Uh, so we are able to do a lot of stuff asynchronously. Uh, Chrome, unfortunately, does not. Uh, so I'm not able just to basically switch to async function. We probably will have to refactor the way we do DNS lookups if we want to 
move to async uh, to run DNS link lookup uh, in async uh, runos mode. And why I want to do this is because uh, web browsers uh, display warning if you do uh, synchronous uh, uh, requests from the main thread, and it also like slows down UI. We do it very rarely, uh, but it's still there. So we want to go away from that. And my plan for this week is to uh, iterate with uh, uh, with browser action uh, uh, action menu a little more, ship new beta, and then push it to the stable channel so people there have this parasiter direct opt out and nice UI toggles, and then get back to debugging. Uh, uh, getting JSIPFS working in Brave with uh, Sockets APIs. And I think that's, that's that I've, I will stop sharing now. Any questions? No, super good. Oh, Alan Shaw, Base32, Strike Force Commander. Oh yeah, uh, can I go next? <laughs> All right then. I need, I need to leave early. Um, um, can I go next? <laughs> as long as you blow our minds. I will attempt to. Please proceed. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, oh, we normally do a screen share, right? It is customary. It is customary. Unless you'd uh, like to entertain us with your eyebrows. Uh, can you see that? Can you see uh, my screen? See it. With my great background? Your background. <laughs> yes, good. Um, cool. Okay, so I've been working on JSIPFS. Uh, I found an or no, multiple people reported issues with not being able to find content when they're using JSIPFS, um, and it is essentially it essentially boils down to the fact that um, the JSIPFS uses this concept of preload nodes where um, content is kind of slurped up or slurped down from them. They are part of the bootstrap nodes that are in your, on as they are some of the default, default bootstrap nodes for JS IPFS um, and they are Go IPFS nodes. Um, and uh, what, what I saw happening um, was that people were um, connecting to them and they were connecting fine, that was okay. Um, but when they were, so there's this thing called BitSwap, which is the way that IPFS um, uh, exchanges information with other parties. Um, and I could see messages for BitSwap saying, uh, this is my want list, this is the list of uh, CIDs that I want, but, I, but um, it was never getting back a reply from the preload node, even though the preload node definitely had that content. Um, and that was kind of annoying. It meant that a lot of people were not being not able to exchange content. It just stopped working rather suddenly, um, and uh, it was it just took me a while to debug and figure it out uh, and come up with like a uh, a test case that was um, proving it. Um, and uh, it boiled down to the fact that there were two preload nodes in existence with the same peer ID. And that was apparently messing stuff around. And that was because of a failed deployment of some, uh, some preload node. And it, uh, it, didn't, it, it was still running uh, somehow. So anyway, you can read it a bit more about it on the issue if you, like, if you care for that. Um, but anyway, it works again now. And, um, and I figured it out and solved the issue. So hooray. Um, what else? Well, so right now I'm working on getting uh, JSIPFS 035 released. Um, it is stalled a little bit on um, a problem with, so we've got new DHT um, coming in that release. It is the, it has been merged, all the tests pass, all the interrupt tests pass, but it isn't until you actually start running it for a long period of time that you notice that um, your IPFS node will start to use 100% CPU and what JS IPFS has never had to, or LibP2P has never had to deal with before is like 3,000 connections in a, the matter of a minute. Uh, so it's just uh, an issue of kind of rate limiting or throttling connections and things that needs, needs to happen um, is the theory at the moment. Um, and uh, and once that's been resolved, we'll be able to release it. There's a there's a new R 
release candidate out um, and uh, you can have a go, uh, but at the moment it is not stable and will crash after a little while. So annoying, but it will be resolved hopefully this week. Um, I, it is top of my priority list for, for, um, for now. Um, and so the other thing that has been outstanding for a long time that I just got around to, I, I did a lot of kind of sorting out with little tiny bits and pieces um, for this release. One of the interesting things is that there's some types and utilities available on, J, on um, JS IPFS. Once you've created a node or, or a JS IPFS node or a uh, HTTP client, um, you're able to access like a uh, buffer, um, multi-adder, um, CID and other um, utilities like is is IPFS because it's included in the bundle but you have to create an instance before you start using them and so this change moves them off the instance and allows you to just require those things without having to do like new IPFS and then access them from the instance um, so that's just a convenience thing I've been doing loads of interviews for um, for uh, JS roles in protocol uh, I had one like Monday, I've done one just now, and I'm doing one tomorrow. Uh, so that's taking up a bunch of my time. Um, that's me. Next up, uh, I'll be debugging uh, this 100% CPU problem or helping um, Vashko and Jacob do that at least. And then we want to actually do some more like some manual testing to see if this DHT thing even works. It should do. I mean, all of our interrupt tests say that it does, uh, but we just want to have like a, a session where we kind of try and get stuff off each other and things like that just to make sure. Um, and just, you know, final checks like that because it's such a big chunk of a uh, big chunk of functionality that has been missing for so long and it's, a, it's brand new. So um, yeah, we want to make sure it's good before it goes out. Um, and yeah, if I have any more time, then I'll be working on the async iterators endeavor. Um, have been doing that for a long time, and also work um, towards, as uh, Vidal was saying, the CID v1 base 32 um, endeavor as well. Uh, and that's my week uh, in web browsers slash GUI news. Whoa, that was mind blowing. Any I'm, questions? I'm excited about the 0.35 release. It's going to be good. It's going to, when it finally comes out, it will we, be amazing. I think maybe Diogo already PR'd an updated web UI for that one. But if we haven't done that, we should definitely do that. Yes, I think that was the one that got sent to Go IPFS as well. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we probably need to cut another release pretty soon. It's a patch. Oh, we already have one. Yeah, we have one. Okay, yeah. cool. Send me one. Um, yeah. Okay, we will. Or update the existing one. I don't yeah, know. sure. I mean, not, not right now, but. Um, <laughs> cool. cool. All right. Any other Thank questions you. for Alan? No questions for Alan. Okay, let's move on. Da, 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 da. Next in the document order is Enrique. Alas, he can't be here. So I shall share my screen and talk for a while. <gasps> <laughs> Drop in. Okay, so I think probably the highlight from Enrique is that we've re-enabled uh, Deb and Snap and RPM package support. So there was the 0.7 release of desktop that said Linux is not supported, which was kind of our way of saying uh, there's lots of config options and lots of ways that could go wrong that we're not testing for. Um, so we stopped doing the Linux package builds, but that seemed draconian as a solution. So actually what we want to do is encourage people to install these things on Linux and tell us where they don't work and help us fix them. So with Lytle's careful guidance, uh, <laughs> this still says very large Linux is not officially spoiled, which you could probably dial down to please help us make it better. Uh, but the, the important fact is you can now download a dev off here. I would expect to see more things, we've got an app image, we've got a deb. That's a good start. Um, it doesn't quite match the list that, that is claimed, snaps and RPMs, but uh, the point is we want them and they're coming back. And there's a Lisbon chapter of ProtoSchool, so that's exciting. Um, and a new tool, a tool to download a hash from IPFS falling back to an HTTP gateway. Sounds cool, let's have a quick look. 
IPFS or Gateway. It's got an exciting kind of game show style name. So if you like downloading things off HTTP or IPFS where possible, you should use MPX, IPFS or Gateway. Very cool. Um, there's also a tool called npm go ipfs dep, which allows you to go and download, uh, to install go ipfs as a dependency of your app. Uh, and it pulls things from dist.ipfs.o, so he's been fixing things there. And next he's gonna be working on better nodes, status visualization, and robustness for ipfs desktop. This is specifically the situation that if you run a desktop node for a long time, or if you run a go ipfs daemon for a long time, that trying to stop it can take a long time. It, there's a graceful shutdown where it kind of times out connections, closes, cleans up resources. Um, but I'm finding certainly from my machine that uh, it can take 30 seconds, a minute plus to shut down. And for a desktop app, when you toggle a power button, you kind of expect it to do what you ask for. And certainly if it's not, if there's no way we can make it faster, then the desktop app needs to tell the user what is happening. So he's gonna be looking at that. Um, we already have a UI pattern there of showing additional information, da, 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 um, like the size of your repo and the number of connected peers. So my suggestion was to, as a starting point to put a connection status, like connecting, uh, stopping, stopped here. Uh, it's just a quick fix because right now, like if you stop it, sometimes it stops quickly, but if it doesn't stop, then you have no idea what's going on. <gasps> uh, that's Enrique's update. And then on to me. Um, I had a pretty slow week this week, um, mostly doing hundreds of PRs to enroll out website deployment processes. Um, so I haven't got a huge amount to demo, um, although my proudest moment came last night at midnight when I figured out that the problem with ProtoSchool, there was a, um, an open issue on ProtoSchool that basically was framed in terms of IPLD Explorer not loading. And of course that was a red rag to a bull. IPLD Explorer is my baby and I love it. Uh, but I got all these ProtoSchool people telling me that it doesn't work and what was happening. So they were completing uh, a proto school lesson and uh, part of the lesson involves writing some code that uh, you use the DAG API to put some data into your local browser-based JS IPFS node. And then if you get the lesson right and you do put the expected data in, uh, that offers you a link to see, see your data on the IPLD Explorer, which is just a nice way of like showing you that the data you created is reusable and consumable by other applications. So it's a nice feature, um, but it stopped working because, but the visible thing was that the user was being told that their code was correct and it passed. They were offered a link to IPLD Explorer uh, to go and visualize the data they just created. But then IPLD Explorer couldn't find the data they just created. And of course, it looked like a problem with IPLD Explorer, but what was happening was the, the JS IPFS node in Proto school was running quite an old version of JS IPFS and, and also was having something had gone wrong with the bundling of JS IPFS such that the node was not able to connect to any nodes in the network. So it wasn't able to do the connection, the connectivity magic that is currently in place via the preload node to share the content. So the content that you created in the lesson was not accessible to another JS IPFS node, even if it was running uh, on the same machine. Um, the ProtoSchool deliberately creates a unique IPFS repository when it boots up its embedded JS IPFS node. So, it, so running a JS IPFS node in another app, it wasn't able to see the same repository. Uh, but the solution that I came up with it took way longer than it should have done, given the number of files changed. Um, and I'd be interested to get Hugo or anyone's take on this, was I just configured Webpack to resolve IPFS dependencies to the minified dist version. And I mean, after two hours of try trying other Webpack configuration fixes, 
this one worked flawlessly and seemed to have the fewest side effects. So there's an open PR and protocol, but uh, Alan or Hugo or Diogo or anyone who cares about Webpack configurations and JS IPFS bundling, is that, is that a reasonable solution? Go. All answer at once. Uh, no. No? For the long run. But if it works now, just merge it. But we, yes. should, we should find another way. Uh, just mention me on... I'll go there. I'll find the, the, the link. You won't get any module deduping by using that. <laughs> so you'll just end up with a bigger bundle. Hugo, Mr. DS. Yeah. Uh, Alan, sure. You both said words. <laughs> um, that I, I am aware that there are drawbacks to it. Um, it's, I'm interested in, I still haven't figured out why we can't just bundle it. Like, why is Webpack not smart enough to interpret the browser field of the JS IPFS project? Now, I did try adding in the Webpack config that explicitly tells it to respect the browser's field. And I explicitly told it to transpile IPFS, but I then still ran into yet more problems. And I know that Hugo has waded, and Diogo, you've both waded through this maybe six months ago with Create React App. Is there like a quick answer to like what is happening? It's just that bundling large JS IPFS projects that are designed for Node is still difficult. It's the latest version of the CRA. Uh, this is <laughs> this is a view, and this is a view service CLI. Oh, there's an open issue on JS IPFS for view bundling with view. Okay, cool. That I know about. So it, oh. we might be able to solve two issues in one stone. I've at least got a "it's not beautiful but it works" proposal, which is my specialty. From the user perspective, I will say it is beautiful to be looking at actual data that helps you understand what just happened instead of a spinner. So I love it. Users love working apps. All right. Thank um, you, by the way. Oh, no problem. It was, uh, it was one of those like, I'll oh, just do a little exploration. Oh, I can just see a little bit further to the problem. Oh, I can, uh, uh, oh no. It's, <laughs> it's three hours later. Um, I did some other stuff. I'm really proud of the CI stuff, but unnecessarily so, because it's just sysadmin work that I am ill-qualified to do. But I love seeing little uh, IPFS website previews on PRs. The, the hideous roadblock is, because of secrets management, Circle CI is like, ah, but don't enable Circle CI builds on open source repositories from external contributors like fork-based PR, because if you do, you then run the risk of exposing your secrets to anyone who crafts a malicious PR. And of course, I did all this work and then got like reminded, I was trying to close out a bunch of pull requests on the docs.ipfs.io and people like Lidl had a bunch of pull requests. And I was like, Lidl, can you just merge in master so that we can get the preview? And he did, and we didn't get the build because he is not a member of the doc site. And it turns out that we have a draconian policy for membership of, of various repos. Like no one is a member of half of the repos that they should be. Uh, so it's not even that external contributors can't see these previews, it's that we can't see them either. So I'm now trying to come up with a fix for that. Um, if you're interested in that discussion, IPFS DNS. Ollie, yes. uh, the, the CI config is, is like uh, the same for all repos? It is currently, yeah. Um, so what's interesting is the, uh, the, the Docker config is split into two steps and the build step is like whatever build you need for your particular project. And the deploy step is basically the same for everybody. No, I'm talking about the circle file thingy. I'm also talking about that. <laughs> the circle, this circle config. Oh, is that, oh yeah, yeah, sure. So, so my question is, did you look into the R thingy that circle has to centralize the config? Did um, that work out or it was too much trouble? No, not at all. I, look, I looked into it um, in as much as this, that would be a useful thing to pursue next. 
this is like get it working in a way that's reusable. And I, I think an, the orb solution might be the way to go, but I don't know if that solves anything for us in terms of secret management. No, I'm just saying that uh, instead of like having a file in each repo, we can just use your and activate for everything. Yep. I'm just asking it because we will probably gonna need that because yeah. Travis is not gonna be a solution. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly, um, the the gist of it was you basically just copy and paste this and tweak it. But that sounds like a use case for an orb. But if I make it an orb there's still bits that you might want to tweak. So it's finding the right balance of like, here's a, here's a common solution that works for everyone versus actually you are going to want to change things. Um, but please do drop comments on this. And particularly, I want smart people to come up with a solution for this. I'll share this and it's issue number, for those people listening on headphones, number two on IPFS Shipyard, IPFS DNS Deploy. Um, that is enough of my rambling. Uh, Diogo, how are you doing? You want me to need to stop sharing my screen and you want to give us a highlight? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you guys see? Yeah. Yes. Because my network is a bit flaky as always. Uh, so last week, the main, yeah, I did a pull request that it shouldn't be undone, it shouldn't, it should be on the block because basically we're using, we were using reps to, uh, when selecting files in the files list with the keyboard, we were using refs to then uh, select the checkbox to select multiple files. Uh, I made a pull request to stop using Rails and use uh, React Virtualize. It has a function to do that native, and it works better. One, one more. Yoko is telling off people in the office. Yeah, but it's too noisy, too many calls. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, it's not too bad. Yeah, all right. So uh, this is blocked because React virtualized as a bug in the, in the latest version of React that uh, what we're using. I think API is already on, on the way, so I'll wait for it to get merged to the master branch of React virtualized. If it takes too long, I'll probably just fork, as always Zilla said, I'll fork React virtualized, apply the fix there, and merge this branch. But uh, this is not very interesting. What's interesting is the help system. We have an issue that you guys can come. We're talking about how to have like a non logging system to users or something like that. Uh, we have uh, Eric showed how Figma does this. Basically, they have a guided tour going through settings to feature to feature and explain what to do. And I've been looking at uh, React libraries that can do something like that. And I found uh, two. It's React Arrive and React User Tour. User Tour, it's not, and it didn't seem too good. So I made a small demo that I'm going to show you. React Arrive. And I saw this. It's not React, it's plain JavaScript, but I think, I think people like it. And it looks good. I'll probably try to make a demo of some kind of this. As you can see, you click on something and you get an overlay to explain everything. Uh, so, onto my demo using React Very right. This is using, uh, this is for a guided tour on this page, for example. You get a model saying, hey, this is a status page, and you have some steps showing what you can do here. Here you have a node info, some, some information about, next, the bandwidth, network traffic, and then you finish. Next time you'll come here, it won't appear. Uh, or to appear again, you'll have to go to the settings and enable it. On the files, it's the same thing. Or at least it should. Oh yeah, I haven't separated. Okay, I have to refresh. As you can see, we we can do 
this is uh, so we can put gifs or links or whatever inside for example i know there's a lot of technical terms in web ui so we can name a few and just put to reference them and to go to the docs or something like that i think this has to be discussed i just i'm i'm uh, i think the to go on the web ui because what you want to show here is what you can do on the web ui uh, the features that it has and how to use them so i think guided tours are, are the best but if you guys have uh, any suggestion about this please go to that issue and write and i hope this is a pull, uh, an open pull request if you have some feedback the copy and and the, the styling is not final but if you have feedback about this uh, please share, share it this basically is the same. Uh, we go through the features of the page, the breadcrumbs, the folder, the add drop down, and the files list, and that's it. Uh, the next step, mm -hmm. it was what I, I haven't done about the, the explore and the peers because this is just a demo to see if we're under good way, and if it is, I'll continue to, to make this to the rest of the page. Oh, yeah, I'm glad this, this did. Uh, we can have like tips around the page mm -hmm. uh, to point the user where he can click to see info. So if you don't want to get a tour, we can place uh, these kind of things on, on the page okay. to, so the user can click and see info. Uh, what I was thinking, I made a comment here. Uh, I was thinking of how, how should we enable or disable the tours. One solution was to put that in the settings. As I was saying, my network is slow. Very slow. Okay, one, one way is to have like something like this, as we have in the analytics. On the settings, we have a checkbox showing all the tours. And when we go to the status, it uh, it will disable this one because we that. and if you want to disable everything, you just come to the same and disable. I don't know. This is just a suggestion. Another suggestion is yeah, here we go. Is for example here, Heather, where we have the status, we can can have some kind of of uh, an icon with in or something like that that when you click would enable the tour for each page i don't know it's just another su suggestion for the settings one because this is too intrusive because i think we ran the the guided tour one time you probably won't don't want to to use it again and having that i can always hear i don't like it but uh, yeah that's it and then I'm probably going to find something like this to make a demo. This would be cool with the the, the info here to have something like that where you, and we we'll click instead of a guided tour, you will have just a, a, an information like this. I think it's um, being a bit far feedback. I think it's a good idea to have a, a clearly labeled help button or help icon that is always available. Um, I wouldn't. I don't think that's too. Uh, that it's not too much. I think it's useful. Um, it's probably easier to just give people an opt-in, like just just run it again. Give me the give me the help again. Um, one thing that um, the Countly user interface does is like there's a help toggle, and if you toggle help on, then it shows the the marker. Yeah, where there is more help, like it, the, you know, you had the help marker. Um, it had a toggle to turn the help markers on and off, so that the the use case was like, I need help, turn help on, and then it's like these things have help. What? I don't know if that is a saying it out loud. It doesn't sound like a particularly like but that help, would be healthy user experience. But where would that toggle be in the settings? I would make it, I'd put it in the nav bar, if the top bar, if it's going to be that way. 
Um, I'm glad you're thinking about those bits because that's that's the thought that's been brewing in my mind, which is uh, coming up with a pattern where you can easily access this without it being too obtrusive in a way. Um, so if we can find a way, like, it could be on hover when you're over the element, if we are always going to have hover modes. Um, this is a desktop app after all, so I suppose we could at least allow that to be the case. Um, so that then, yeah, those little things do appear next to the uh, the header elements perhaps. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I think I should sketch up some visuals for that. That's um, a, a good challenge. Yeah, I agree that it shouldn't be exclusively buried and set inside like the idea of having something as you're looking at the site. That's always an option to like, toggle on, for example. This is the perfect example. We're going back to the analytics story for events and understanding how many times people press the help for each item uh, to understand like, okay, this <laughs> we may need to define this a little bit further. I think there's also potentially a content thing where it's one thing to say like this part of the page lets you see the list of peers, but what if I don't know why I should care about a list of peers? Like there's a lot of stuff when I look at these sites that I'm like, why do I care about this? Like what, it, okay, I understand this list of peers, but so what? And how, how in depth do you want to get in that with these descriptors or go out to some clear description elsewhere? But I would definitely, personally, I would err on the side of more mm. when they're asking for help. But Absolutely. I, yeah. I think um, I strongly agree. Like I want this to, I, I find envisaging it as like two layers of like, here's some quick intro help, like one paragraph that's like, here's what this does. And if that doesn't help you, then like, here's more, like, here's a like, what's a peer? Why am I connected to so many or none? And why have they got like these crazy peer IDs? And just like a whole like stream of consciousness, like here's everything we got. Um, and then here's the link to the proto school training and camp on why you should care about peer IDs. Um, yeah, and I'm happy if you if you decide to handle it that way and you want help generating the like help. What does a beginner not know right yeah. now? Like yeah. what are they confused about? I can help you with that. Perfect. I got lots of questions and I'm super confused. Great. Stay that way, but not forever. <laughs> right on. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, how how should I proceed about this? That's um, I think the question. I think you are proceeding well, and I think uh, the things that are going to be really helpful are generating this Google Doc that starts to capture the things that we think need help. Um, it's one thing, so it's useful for you to do the UI proposals, but if you could also kick off the document that, that we can all contribute to, that's like, here's the things that we think need explaining, and here's where we think, like, these are the sorts of topics of help that we imagine. Um, a shared Google Doc that we can all start putting content in would be really great. Um, and that would be something that Terry Terry could definitely like guide us on as well. Once we do the skeleton, she can also be like, none of this helps me understand. Or she can be like, finally, you explained it. Jesus, it took you so long. Yeah, okay. But what about, so are you guys in favor of having like a, a, a kind of tour and kind of a glossary, uh, another type of help? I'm, I'm in favor of uh, putting a pin in the guided tour style. I, I'd like to see a, the Chardin style, although I think that's gonna be pretty similar. Um, and I'd like to loop back with Chris and with Eric and just like get some more thoughts from them about the user experience and look and feel of this. Yeah, all right. I'll kick off the document and we can cool. discuss it. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Um, we're close to time due to a long, a lengthy preamble on this call. Um, da, 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 da. Hugo, do you want to drop a date? Oh, no, wait. It's Terry. Terry, you want to add any thoughts? The old mute button. There's, okay. nothing like, there's nothing like the excitement of being next up to help the meet button. Woo! Yeah. Um, okay, so the file stuff I'm working on, we're still just like figuring out the UI that's gonna work, but we're making some progress. So our file drop now, it's like 
is built to not deal with folder uploads to avoid some problems, which we'll wait and see how the content plays out, whether we need to build that back in, in which case I'll be coming back here for help. Um, the thing that it's new is when I was trying to do the validation, I wanted to set it up so I could tell whether the problem was with the upload or with the code. And I decided that was too much work. So I did this. Um, always open to feedback there. And you can find a link to the open uh, PR. Oh, I don't. Okay. Uh, and then this is something I would like to ask for your help with. You can find this link in the document. I am trying to work on a proto school roadmap and the con, which will include other stuff, but it will partially include like what are the tutorials we need to build. And I have dropped issues in the various project teams uh, repos, asking for those ideas, particularly Ollie, as you're meeting about OKRs, it might be a good time to talk about what is coming up in your roadmap, what are the priorities you have, and what content in proto school format would be helpful there, or like the links we build in from one place to another, any of that stuff. Um, so feel free to drop, ish, drop ideas here and I'll merge it with the input from the other teams. And one of the things we will do with this information is figure out how much work teams have in mind. The more I can get documentation of teams needing things, the more power we have to potentially hire people so we can have <laughs> content come faster. Uh, so please do feel free to throw lots of ideas. There. That's it. Cool, thank you very much. I mean, would it is a web UI walkthrough tutorial reasonable content for proto school or is that something like seems because proto school already has like the notion of non coding challenges just like here is a series of lessons in words yeah we've done some without exercises when it, let's talk a little more later or yeah. drop an idea in about specifically like the format you have in yeah. mind and I, there it's it more of a, like it feels like maybe it's not a great fit but so but yeah we should definitely talk about um, the other thing we're thinking about adding to proto school is at the end of each tutorial there would be a page of links out to more material so if there's material that doesn't fit that format well but it's like so let's say that at the end of this file tutorial, it's like learn more about working with files. Oh, here's an example of what you could build with this. And it goes to the web UI or share thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that's another place we can make some connections. Yeah, yeah, sure. Super cool. All right, moving on. Hugo, you want to give us a highlight? You are also muted. Okay, so I'll be doing a lot of bundle size stuff, getting some of our dependencies to upgrade to readable stream 3, like BL, Tarstream, Concat, stuff like that. Also did a little bit of debugging on the Windows issue, running the tests. Um, this is uh, related to Travis, basically the VM is not set up properly, so the tests don't run. Um, but yeah, we're still stuck with that. Uh, I had to debug an uh, issue. This already came up uh, a couple of times. We need to figure out a way to solve this. It, this is related to, as we use uh, CommonJS, basically we require stuff, uh, but some of our dependencies already uh, are using uh, ES modules uh, and basically in some environments like Electron and stuff like that um, where Webpack is used instead of um, prioritizing the browser um, property on the package JSON they prioritize the module property so they use the ES module version. So the, the default imports and exports don't work the same way between CommonJS and ES modules. And that uh, gets get, get us to uh, some issues on those platforms. We need to figure out a way to fix this 
uh, this one specifically is, is about the big number JS package. That's an easy one because the common JS version and the ES module version are uh, well done. So we can, with one solution, uh, fix everything and make it work in every the platform. But some of the some packages don't are as well written as this one, so it's going to be a little bit harder. But so I'll get there sometime in the future. Um, I did. Um, a priority list for the sync iterators um, endeavor. Basically, I went through all the repos um, and f find find out uh, which ones were like B0s, meaning they don't depend on any of our other uh, repos. Uh, then I went to the P1s that depend on B0s, and after the P2s, and after that, P3s and plus are not like um, specified here. I just put there P3 plus. So because it's not, it's not worth the time to go through them now, we just need to finish P0s and P1s and P2s and basically release a version with uh, async await or async iterators and make sure everything works. And if we need to like go back and fix something on the callback version, we should like bump the previous version and stick with the uh, sync awaits on uh, like a major or a minor at least. Um, did also some bug fixing on the Karma uh, mocha tests. They were not using the same timeout as the uh, mocha, uh, like node mocha tests. So now they do. Uh, did some prototyping for the companion, um, IPFS companion. We already talked about that. And finally got to fix it, fixing the pro pro proper log file slip issue. Um, that's basically done. I just need to make, to make the PR. Uh, is Alan still here? No, no. Yeah, I'll talk with him later. But yeah, that's basically fixed. Uh, hopefully, it will, will be released uh, as soon as possible. Um, I also find found out this issue about Electron. Hopefully, you all your ideas can have a look. Basically, this guy is saying that uh, running uh, inside Electron. This syntax basically object spread is not like uh, supported, which as uh, I think it should, but I don't actually know Electron enough. But I just said to him that you guys will probably have some more insights. So if you can please look at, into it and give us some more uh, ideas about this. Hopefully, we'll not need to like uh, rewrite this with object assigned because this is like valid JS now. Um, but yeah, I don't know enough about Electron to solve this stuff. And next, I'll be finishing up the bundle size pull requests and also um, async await and async iterators pull requests. And that's it. Cool. I will take a look at the Electron thing, um, or I'll talk to Enrique <laughs> about it. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, Chris, do you want to share anything? Absolutely. It's time to con contribute on these calls. Um, all right. <laughs> I'm in. Let me share my desktop. There we go. Over. OK. Well, we'll start with this one while it's up. Um, so obviously the discussions around uh, the intrusive, unobtrusive health system have been going ahead. I really like the ideas that are um, coming uh, out of this and obviously the prototype that uh, has been mocked up. Um, uh, I've been thinking about how we could also uh, potentially capture some more user feedback. Um, and one of those would be a, a secondary layer of input from users, which potentially be a, using a chat widget of some sort 
Um, I believe there were some other conversations around this before, um, but we need to capture our thoughts. So I'd like to get his, uh, some opinions and ideas down on this issue. Um, so essentially, just to give some context, uh, it wouldn't be a, a help system that potentially would be around all the time. It would be more of a, a on-demand um, chat system that will be available when one of us is on support duties. So, so we've got a direct call to action to, to get some input from, from potential users of the web UI um, and then use some of that to help refine and discuss uh, future iterations of the, of the interface. Um, it's a rough idea right now, but it's kind of, uh, I'll put some suggestions and ideas around uh, how this has been done with other products and, uh, and clients and some potential partners uh, that we could use, because it will be an embedded widget. I don't ex expect us to build this one uh, ourselves. Um, and then uh, just to give uh, a loop around what I'll be working on within the next uh, iteration will be the React component library. So uh, taking some of the pieces from um, uh, the existing apps and basically placing them into a, a centralized component library that we can then recycle uh, and reuse across or we consume across our, our apps. Um, so the first one will be looking at the IPLD Explorer. Um, Ollie and I went over this in detail this morning um, and figuring out how we can, we can do that, uh, create a pattern uh, for having the inter internationalization built in as well and uh, have those components reusable across all of our interfaces and products that we build, starting with IPFS, but potentially bigger. Um, and I know because we're tight for time, there's just one more thing, which is we actually announced the IPFS camp of the, last week. So <laughs> that is happening on uh, June 27th to 30th in Barcelona. Please apply. No, you don't need to, but <laughs> um, share with your friends. We'll um, be iterating on this site uh, as of the, as the weeks go on. So we'll be getting a full schedule planned out um, and uh, yeah, basically adding all, all more feedback to it. So if you've got any ideas around um, what you'd like to see, or if it doesn't work on your phone or something, then please let me know. Uh, you know where to find me. And that's it. Chris. Any ideas? Uh, any feedback? <laughs> are you, yeah, are you also planning on documenting in non reacty ways the stuff that you're documenting for React? Like the component kinds of stuff? Potentially longer term. I think initially we need to hit some. Uh, some use cases for our own apps so i would say that this has to be uh, the the ultimate aim will be that yes we can consume this in different ways or with different libraries um but the initial sketch of this will be using or moving or porting the versions of what we already have that are scattered across the products so uh there's like a two a two-phase release to this so uh, v1 will be just moving the furniture making sure everything works and uh, is a, a bit more accessible for everybody and then the second part of that will be creating a design system around that um, that will then help set the tone for how we could consume that across PL. Um, and obviously then people are gonna have different opinions and uh, expectations of what they'd like to use and that's that's completely valid. So we want to widen that discussion up, um, uh, but it's, it's gonna take some time to figure out exactly how we can do that. Uh, for, for basic interfaces and components that are just going to be presentational, so not too interactive, then that will be easier because it will mostly just be static HTML uh, and a set of classes. But anything that starts to consume data or have interaction, then it, it gets difficult because we might need to have alternative versions like a view library version and a, 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 a React version. But um, with the release of Storybook 5, which has uh, coincided very nicely with this, um, the that also consumes uh, different versions of um, user interface libraries like Vue. So we can actually side by side show um, an Angular version, a Vue version, uh, and uh, a React version all with inside the same storybook, which will be a nice value add. <laughs> Super cool. I think it's um, just to kind of reiterate the step one is to take a bunch of components that we already use in web UI and we've got some duplicates in uh, share files or things that do similar UI things. Uh, so we're going to be making a component library that just means we can reuse those things. Um, but it's very important to me personally that for all of the simple components, as Chris said, like the presentational ones that don't have interactivity, that, that we have some good documentation that lets people using other libraries like copy and paste and HTML, and it works. Like there are lots of, if 
if we were less of an open source sprawling non-hierarchical organization we might be a bit more like everyone must use these react components so that we can control rollout of new iterations of the design system but that isn't like proto school is rightfully like diverging and finding its own path but having like good basics that you can copy and paste i think is definitely one of my goals for this and yeah. then in, in 10 years time i can massively regret <laughs> that when everything is chaos but i think um what i like this sort of stems from my belief that like tachyons is like the right level of publishing a, a basic design system that allows distributed creativity that still has harmony without the teams having to coordinate um you know, Tachyons has been very helpful when I've, like, eventually I figured out how to copy elements from the browser inspector, since I have no idea where the HTML is in React yet. And that okay. was, and recognizing the classes once I stole it was very helpful. Super cool. That is really good to hear. Um, and one slight aside on that with the Tachyons thing, um, it, we've obviously got the baseline flavor that's IPFS styled, and then there'll be some customization on top. So as part of the exploration of working on the IPFS campsite, I've basically built a uh, an augmenting class modifier so you can basically put in your theme variables and then it will output and change things in in uh, in real time so if you wanted to have a different flavor to it slightly that's just more of the theme colors then you so you still get the harmony of uh, what ollie was saying or the, the system underneath with the typography and things but then you want to have a, a slight different variation on that you can do that with these because right now it's quite difficult if you just include ipfs css it's kind of baked uh, baked in solution so um yeah We'll be experimenting with ways of doing that and hopefully set some patterns down. Excited. Super cool. Um, unless there is any other business, we are at quarter past the hour. Sorry, everyone. Such a big old call. Hugo, he's not happy with that. He's, he's got things, things to do, people to see. Um, let me just double check. There's nothing vital. No one's added anything massively important. Okay. I think we are good. You can have your lives back. It's been another in web browsers and IPFS GUI team weekly sync call. Thank you very much for joining us and see you this same time, same place next week. Yeah. The crowd goes wild. Yeah.